Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope that you're doing well. My name is Professor Andrew Timming, and I am the author of the textbook Applied Statistics, from which this lecture and others in this lecture series were derived. So this is the second lecture corresponding to chapter 11 of the textbook, which focuses on factor analysis, both exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis. In the previous lecture, you'll recall that I gave you a brief introduction to what factor analysis is, and I explained that uh, unlike the other statistical tests that we've covered so far in the book, factor analysis does not involve independent and dependent variables. So we're not trying to predict an outcome based on a set of independent variables using factor analysis. Instead, what we're trying to do is to understand how, whether, or the extent to which a set of single item observable variables hang together. And when they hang together in a coherent and logical way, they create what I have referred to as a latent variable. A latent variable is an unobservable variable, so we can't see it directly, but we assume that it exists by virtue of its relation to observable variables, that is to say, single item indicators. So in this lecture, we're gonna go a little bit more deeply into the technical aspects surrounding factor analysis. Here, once again, you can see the textbook that we're using, Applied Statistics, Business and Management Research. And of course, I would urge you to read chapter 11 if you haven't already before proceeding in this lecture. Okay, we're going to start with uh, an explanation of exploratory factor analysis. And then once we're done with that, we'll move on to confirmatory factor analysis. So the first thing I wanna do is explain to you how exploratory factor analysis is related to Pearson's R correlation coefficient, which is a bivariate statistical test that you've already learned about earlier in the textbook. So let's start with an example. Let's say you have 10 single items and each item measures, you assume, uh, overall health. And among these 10 items on your questionnaire, let's say that five of them uh, measure mental health, so how you're mentally feeling, and the remaining five measure physical health, so how your physical body is at the moment. So the question is, should you treat these 10 items as one overall measure of health, that is to say a one factor solution to these 10 items, or does it make more sense to treat them as a two factor solution? So to look at uh, whether the five mental health uh, items load onto a latent variable surrounding mental health and the five physical health items load onto a latent variable surrounding physical health. So what you do with a factor analysis is you begin with a data matrix. And this matrix consists of a set of bivariate correlations. So as I said, you've learned about Pearson's R correlation coefficient, which uh, looks at the relationship between two variables. Uh, and it gives you a coefficient that's always between negative one and one. So the first thing you might do here is to look at this set of bivariate correlations among the 10 items. And you might assume that if Pearson's R is higher just among the mental health variables than with all the other variables and vice versa, then this might indicate potentially two separate constructs at play. But in fact, this approach is much too subjective, which is why we instead rely on factor analysis to identify latent constructs. So a key concept in exploratory factor analysis is the concept of the factor loading. So what's a factor loading? So you'll recall in the context of bivariate analysis, we are only looking at the relationship between two variables at a time. But as I said before, 
Factor analysis is a multivariate technique, so it looks at multiple variables simultaneously. And what factor analysis is interested in is the factor loadings that describe the relationship between each observable indicator in your data set and the wider factors or latent variables that are unobservable. So it's a bit like a coefficient, but instead of a coefficient between two observable variables, it's a coefficient between observable variables and unobservable latent variables. So the factor loading could be described as the individual contribution that each single item indicator or variable in your data set makes to the wider latent factor, assuming that the factor actually exists. Now, I should point out that you are perfectly within your rights to use ordinal and scale level indicators in factor analysis, similar to regression analysis. You can also use binary or dummy variables, but I would urge you to keep these to a minimum. And the reason is that the use of these types of dummy variables in factor analysis can introduce uh, excess noise that makes it difficult to identify factors. So ideally, you should stick with ordinal or scale level variables in your factor analysis. Another option is Bartlett's test of sphericity. This is a statistical test that can tell you whether there are any uh, significant correlations within the bivariate correlation matrix that we just talked about that could potentially lend themselves to factor analysis. Now the mathematics underlying exploratory factor analysis is pretty complex and given the fact that this textbook is applied statistics rather than theoretical statistics, uh, I don't see a need to go uh, very deep into the mathematics, but I thought I'd just give you a general overview so that you understand what's going on when you run an exploratory factor analysis. So the method that we use to extract factors, that is to say to, to extract latent variables from observable items, is pretty complex math and essentially it's based on the logic of distinguishing between different types of variances. So we'll start by identifying the total variance uh, amongst all our variables, all our single item observable variables. And once we've identified the total variance, then we look for common or shared variance with the variables within the matrix. So we try and look at uh, close relationships, close bivariate relationships amongst the variables within the data set. Once we've identified total and common variance, then we move on to identify unique variance. So this is the variance that is specific to individual variables. And then we identify the error variance. So this is all the leftover variance uh, that we haven't accounted for uh, as of yet. And we can consider this error variance a residual error term in the context of our factor analysis. So carrying out this procedure, we need to identify a criterion in order to decide how many factors exist within our data set. And what we use is something called the latent root criterion, right? So this optimizes the correct number of factors given your set of single item observable indicators in your data set. And we use a statistic called an eigenvalue to identify whether a latent factor exists. And the way the eigenvalue works is that if the value is greater than one, then this suggests the existence of a factor. So interpretation of the eigenvalue is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Let's go back to the example I gave earlier of the 10 health items, five of which uh, pertain to mental health and five to physical health. So if only one factor among those 10 items uh, was generated with an eigenvalue that's greater than one, then we can assume that there is only one construct or latent variable amongst those 10. So we would treat those 10 as a single factor, an overall, for example, an overall health factor. But if two factors emerge, 
and both factors have eigenvalues that are greater than one, then we can conclude alternatively that there are two latent variables amongst those 10 uh, items rather than one. And obviously the most likely uh, latent factors or latent variables given these 10 items is one that measures mental health and another that measures physical health. Now the eigenvalue is a statistical cutoff that we use to determine the optimum number of factors in your data set. And in addition to looking at the eigenvalues to identify eigenvalues that are greater than one, we can also produce something called a scree plot that helps us to illustrate or visualize the two or more factor solution. Obviously in the case of the, the example we're looking at right now, it would be a two factor solution. But if you have multiple factors uh, amongst your single item indicators, a scree plot would show you uh, how many factors exist given your configuration of data. So you might be wondering how these magical eigenvalues are produced. What is the procedure, the mathematical procedure that we use in order to generate an eigenvalue and therefore identify latent variables within our data set? Well, eigenvalues are produced through a process called factor rotation. And it's a bit complex, but let me see if I can walk you through this, all right? So conceptually, exploratory factor analysis begins with a matrix of bivariate correlations. As we explained, we might look at the Pearson's R correlation amongst the single item indicators. And then it extracts the best linear combinations of those variables that can statistically be clumped together. So when I say about clumped together, I mean they kind of hang together naturally. They appear to have shared variance in as much as they're measuring uh, the same or very similar underlying factor. Now this is considered the unrotated factor solution and it's not enough in and of itself in order to confirm that a factor exists. What we do with the unrotated factor solution is we rotated it to make sure that these clumps, right, these clumps of uh, potential latent variables still make sense after rotation. So when you rotate it, you're going to see the first factor emerge, which essentially signals the greatest amount of shared variance. If a second factor exists, it will mean it will essentially be uh, constituted of the leftover residual variance that uh, was ex uh, excluded from the first factor's creation. And then once a second factor is confirmed, then a third factor will be looked for based on all the leftover variants from the first and second factors and so on and so forth. So this is kind of the general process that it goes through. Generally speaking, the first factor that you extract or the first latent variable that you identify in your data set is the strongest. But remember that any factor with an eigenvalue that's greater than the cutoff of one can be interpreted as a meaningful factor. Any factor that has an eigenvalue of less than one is not really a factor at all. It just is a set of single item indicators that don't seem to logically hang together. There are different types of rotation that you can use in the context of exploratory factor analysis. Uh, one of the methods that uh, is typically used is what we call orthogonal rotation. It's the simplest uh, and also therefore probably the most common uh, form of rotation. And what this involves is rotating your solution by 90 degrees on a 360 degree axis. It's simple, it's straightforward, uh, and it works well. Another form of rotation is what we call oblique rotation. Uh, this is perhaps more flexible than orthogonal rotation uh, in the sense that it's not constrained to a simple 90 degree rotation, right? You can have different degrees of rotation in oblique rotations, but essentially it produces the same or, or very similar effect. So uh, I guess my my recommendation if you're doing factor analysis is just to stick with the simplest form of rotation and request an orthogonal rotation when you're trying to extract uh, a set of factors from your data set. Uh, regardless, you need to use some form of rotation because as I said in the previous slide, uh, 
an unrotated solution uh, doesn't confirm the existence of factors. So you'll need to use some form of rotation and my recommendation is orthogonal rotation. Now you'll recall that factor loadings are essentially uh, coefficients uh, similar to Pearson's R that describe the relationship between single item indicators and the existence, presumed existence of your latent variables. So the factor loading is the last step of the exploratory factor analysis. After you've done the rotation, then you can uh, identify the, uh, qu the qualities of your factor loading. So we know how many factors there are based on the eigenvalues. If they're greater than one, then it, it constitutes a latent variable. Now we need to assign observable variables to the factors themselves. And what we do is we use the factor loading to do that. And generally speaking, any item with a factor loading that's greater than 0.4 gets assigned to that factor. That's the generally accepted cutoff. Now, you should note that some of the items may load onto two or more factors. And when this happens, my recommendation is that you should potentially think about dropping those items because when a single item loads on two or more factors, it suggests that you don't have good discriminant validity amongst your factors. You should also note that there may be some variables in your data set that don't load onto any of the factors. And of course, you can think about whether or not you want to retain them under the circumstances. All right, now that you know a bit about exploratory factor analysis, let's look at some of the technical details surrounding confirmatory factor analysis. So you'll recall from the previous lecture that confirmatory factor analysis is always theory driven. In other words, we're looking at theory and we're uh, coming up with or developing a hypothesis or a set of hypotheses about how we expect these single item variables to hang together in the form of a latent variable. So we might have an a priori expectation of a particular latent structure. And what we do is based on that theory, we can test our model specification and assess whether or not our uh, proposed model is correct or not. Instead of using p-values to generalize from the sample of the population, confirmatory factor analysis uses something called critical ratios. And critical ratios are essentially the exact same thing as a p-value, but they're expressed differently. They're expressed in standardized terms. In other words, they're sort of p-values that have been converted into z-scores. And uh, a p-value of less than 0.05 corresponds to a critical ratio of plus or minus 1.96. So if you do a confirmatory factor analysis and your critical ratio is above 1.96 or below negative 1.96, this indicates or suggests statistical significance uh, pertaining to your factor structure. Now the mathematics underlying confirmatory factor analysis is pretty complex and it's based on matrix algebra. Again, I don't see the need in an applied statistics textbook to go in too deeply into these mathematics, but I'll just explain very briefly um, how factor analyses are uh, carried out. So confirmatory factor analysis starts with an analysis of the covariances amongst a set of observable items. A covariance is a lot like a Pearson's R correlation coefficient in that it describes the relationship between two variables simultaneously, but unlike Pearson's R, the covariance is not standardized between negative one and one. A covariance is similar to a B coefficient in simple regression. It depends on the scale of the variables used. Now the relationships between the single item indicators and the latent variable are described by a set of variances and covariances as well as regression coefficients. And then algebra, as I said, matrix algebra is used to estimate the population covariance matrix. The results of a confirmatory factor analysis essentially compare the parameters of the sample, 
to the parameters of the estimated population matrix and it's through this process that you can confirm whether your proposed or hypothesized model is a good fit or a bad fit and again that will come with a critical ratio attached to it one key concept in the context of uh, confirmatory factor analysis is the idea of model identification and this is a little complex too but don't worry if you don't quite understand it because uh, it will become clear as you start to practice confirmatory factor analysis so in order to use cfa a factor has to have a minimum of three observable items attached to it so you this is say you can't identify a factor if you only have two variables you have to have three or more variables that load onto that factor and the reason we need three per factor uh, is that you need to have a model that is identified or properly identified so three different types of identification there's the over identified models which is a good thing you want to have a model that's over identified this means that you have sufficient data points and parameters or weights to be freely estimated there's also a just identified model which has the absolute minimum number of data points that you need in order to estimate it right it has the same number of data points as structural parameters and then there's the under identified model where you find a mismatch between the number of data points and structural parameters that need to be estimated and essentially if your model is under identified it just won't run it can't run because the model has to be either just identified or over identified preferably over identified so because of this concept of model identification what we need to do is we need to fix one of the three or more loadings per factor at 1.00 and this fixing of one of those parameters at 1.00 allows the other two or more items to be freely estimated all right so let's summarize what we've learned here uh, we've learned about latent variables in this chapter and that they are unobserved constructs that uh, we can't see or measure directly but we know that they exist indirectly by virtue of the relationship they have with single item indicators these latent variables are much too complex and multifaceted to be captured by a single item in a survey we looked at two different forms of factor analysis exploratory factor analysis means that we enter into the analysis with no preconceived notions or theories or hypotheses in terms of the underlying constructs that we might look for whereas confirmatory factor analysis is always theory driven and therefore we enter into the analysis with a priori ideas or hypotheses of precisely how the items or at least how we expect the items to load onto the latent constructs okay at this stage i would ask you to press pause and go through these six questions either individually or in groups and thank you very much thanks for bearing with me i hope you learned a thing or two about factor analysis both exploratory and confirmatory and I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter, which happens to be the final chapter where we will be looking at structural equation modeling. Bye, everyone.